Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming to the CLE uh, uh, on State v. Sweden and the right to confront witnesses over uh, video conferencing. Um, uh, Jennifer Winkler gave this talk to another group of people and uh, offered to present it uh, to OPD, which of course I never say no to uh, a good CLE speaker. Um, I think all of you know Jennifer, um, so probably don't need much in the way of, of bio or really much further in the way of introduction. I'm, um, if you have questions during the event, please uh, use the chat and I will relay them when there's an opportunity. And um, got another person joining. Um, you can go ahead and take it away, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Okay, can everyone hear me? Hopefully, all right. So State versus Sweden, um, here's my first slide. There's the site. Um, this is a pre-pandemic internet video testimony case. We argued it in division uh, three in the cold month of December in Spokane. Um, actually, Kate um, Huber from Washington Appellate Project and I um, shared Ubers, so that was fun. Um, and, um, the moral of the story is never eat at the Spokane airport, but that's another story. Um, so it, this was actually argued in the before times before we knew what was coming. Um, the case came out in April of 2020, which was still um, before we really knew what was coming. Um, and so I have shepherdized it to see where it's gone since April. Um, I gave this talk in July and as of July, it had made it to appellate briefing in Florida, um, which is actually not it's actually some pretty good appellate briefing if anyone's looking to rip something off. And it actually made it to a law review article. I think that there's a couple. The best one is the Boston College one, um, which I give you the site for there. Um, it's like an electronic supplement. So that's why I kind of, that's the Westlaw site, um, which actually is, it's uh, has kind of an alarmist name, um, the, the law review article. It's and justice for none. And then it's talking about the um, how no one, how terrible all the um, uh, remote testimony and the remote jury selection things that are happening around the country. It's pretty alarmist, probably justifiably so. It does not like swayed on. It thinks that we have, um, it thinks that we have uh, forgotten our face-to-face -face language in the state constitution and allowing what it allows. Um, so it's, the law review article is good. I don't know that it's uh, totally accurate regarding the Swainon case, but moving on. So um, there's Antonio. Um, so when I saw that um, Judge Fearing was gonna be on the panel, that was me, I was really excited because I think he is, you know, one of our finest judges um, in the state. And I think he was, I thought he would actually give our arguments um, uh, a fair hearing, which, so that's good. So I was happy, just like Antonio there. Um, and here's my favorite dissent from Fearing, just cause, just from over the summer. Um, I thought um, this is the case where we have the protester on the railroad tracks, as I recall. And I thought the list of names he provided would be a really good homeschooling list. Um, for children. I haven't quite got around to it yet. I was really excited to see Roger Williams in there. Some of these people I don't even know about. Um, but this is an awesome, awesome descent. And I am always excited to see Fearing's name on something, um, as I'm sure you guys all know. Um, but back to the issue at hand, sweet on. Um, here's the holding. I'll read it because why not? We hold that the co trial court failed to adequately conduct a hearing and explain it its ruling when authorized video, authorizing video conference testimony. From experience, we recognize the difficulty encountered by superior courts when confronting unique questions of law during the course of a trial with the lack of time and resources to study the questions because we find any constitutional, wah, wah, we find any constitutional error to be harmless. We would otherwise not discuss the underlying merits of Mr. Swedon's challenge to the video testimony, but we do so in this instance to provide guidance for trial courts asked to permit remote testimony and criminal prosecutions just in time, just in time. So um, the facts of Swedon, um, 
don't they don't necessarily make it through that well um, into the oops where am I well you you can just ruminate on uh, civil rule forty three for a second the fact of Sweden are it's super sad his he and his wife were Syrian refugees um their families had it was like brother against brother sister against sister like just terrible they actually spent some time in Jordan they were among the like millions and millions of refugees to come out of uh, Syria in that really short period um so they were they made it to the Tri-Cities and they were really both working their asses off. Um, and Mr. Sweden worked at a Tyson plant. And unfortunately um, for the case, his job was cutting things. Um, so he, he was accused of coming home from work and stabbing his wife a lot. She did, she did survive, um, but their um, son was present at the time. So how this comes about is Mr. Sweden, who's Arabic speaking, goes to the hospital and he's put in touch with a medical interpreter in Michigan who, whose name is Mesa Haddad. And he talks um, during the, um, he talks during the, uh, when he's talking to the doctor, she has to translate. And she hears him saying, giving the explanation for how he got cut, which is he says he got cut at work. The state's theory is of course that he cut himself while he was stabbing his wife. But when the doctor leaves the room, and this is something the state really fixates on, um, he actually curses his wife, says stuff like, may God not bless her. And the state actually really relied on this a lot and argued it in closing and saying, you know, his, the, the defense theory at trial was that she had um, basically attacked him and stabbed herself. And so this was not helpful to Mr. Swedon. Um, so before trial, the prosecution wanted Ms. Haddad to to testify remotely because her mother was gravely ill. And it cited a bunch, and the state cited a bunch of federal, mostly habeas cases and a few state cases, but it also cited state versus Cayetano Jaimes, which was a division one case. I, it was, I believe, Elaine Winters. And it's a great case, um, but it's about the right to present a defense. And they also, the prosecution also relied on uh, criminal rule 43, um, which says that for good cause and in compelling circumstances and with appropriate safeguards, the court may permit testimony in open court by contemporary, contemporaneous transmission from a different location. And um, so good cause and compelling circumstances. Um, and so here is what Haddad said. Here's, we're gonna try to satisfy, we're, we're looking at criminal, or I'm sorry, civil rule 43. Here's Haddad's declaration. Basically, she's caring for her seriously ill mother, although there's some nuances in that. It's like bad, 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 but there's a couple nuances that actually I tried to tease out and that, and that Fearing picks up on. And there's actually some federal authority to kind of uh, separate some of the things that she's claiming. So there's actually a doctor's note attached, um, but neither signed this under penalty of perjury um, and Fearing did not like that. He keeps talking about that. So that's actually something that he picked up on, on that I didn't um, really emphasize, but that was really disturbing to the court in this case. Um, so here's Cayetano Jaimes. And um, like I said, it is a right to present a defense case it is not useful for the state. The state always wants to say that they have, you know, parallel rights to the defense. I'm not, I see it time and time again, I'm sure you all do too. And I'm not sure where, where they get this idea because there's no real parallel, right? I mean, there's fairness, but it's not the same thing. So Cayetano Jaimes, we're allowing um, someone from, I believe Mexico who can't get back into the US um, to testify telephonically. And it comes down to the, the right of the accused, not the right of the state. Um, and so actually, Swiden's counsel, um, who did a great job, um, says, hey, uh, this is great and all, but what about confrontation? Um, and also, can't anyone else care for Ms. Haddad's mother? So the trial court allows the testimony. Um, and here's the uh, Division III's um, summary of what the trial court did. And so what they say is based on a review of the testimony anticipated from Ms. Haddad and after balancing the concerns of the confrontation clause and the right of the parties to cross-examine the witness in court, Skype is an effective way for the witness to testify. So there's sort of a lip service to the confrontation clause, but there's really no, there. That, this is it. There's no findings, nothing really. 
And so I'm looking at this word effective. So Skype is effective. Is that good enough? Is, it, is that cool? So I have some gifts. Abed from community from several years ago, because all my gifts are dated, thinks it's cool. And here's a new, slightly newer one. Here's Jake Peralta thinking it's cool. Yeah, it's not cool. It's not cool, man. So um, on appeal, we argue, hey guys, that's not cool. And division three agrees. Um, so here's what division three says. So they go out of their way. They say, hey, they, they really telegraph that this is harmless, unfortunately, but they want to provide guidance to trial courts. And here's the test for Maryland versus Craig. And they highlight this. So we have, um, we need to make sure that having this witness testify not in court necessarily furthers an important public policy and the procedure otherwise assures the reliability of the testimony. And um, the court <laughs> declines to tell us what the standard of review is, very coy. And the court is coy again, this is a coy court, um, but it's actually, there's a lot of stuff for us as appellate attorneys and trial attorneys in this Maryland versus Craig test. And there's a lot of places to go. And that's what the remaining portion of the presentation, second half maybe of the presentation is about. So um, we don't know the standard of review because simply put, the court says, we, we didn't even get close here, court. So what satisfies prong one necessarily furthers an important public policy interest. So the court separates those two concepts. So you don't need a de legislative declaration of pu public policy, according to Swedon. I tried to argue this, it was rejected. Um, and the reason for that is because in the previous leading case in Washington, uh, the Foster case, we actually have a statute and it talks about the need for uh, child abuse victims to testify and basically not be traumatized. So I tried to say, hey, we need some kind of legislative declaration here. And uh, Swedon, the Swedon case does not agree with that, um, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad argument. Let's go back. Um, so, Public, important public policy is narrowly defined and so is necessary. So the witness probably needs to be essential to the state's case. I don't know that Ms. Haddad really qualified. Um, I tried to argue that it was really material and arguing that it was um, harmful, but it was a medical interpreter. And it, I, I don't know that given the other evidence in the case, she really qualified. So I was sort of between a rock and a hard place on that one. Um, serious illness, as the court goes through several federal cases and state cases, serious illness of the witness is probably enough. So is location outside the US under certain circumstances under some of the federal cases. And this comes up a lot in federal cases. Um, and the witness's mother's serious illness might be enough. We, know, we don't know here, um, according to the court, because the record is inadequate. Um, and so, um, And I'm going to go back to Foster for a second. Foster was the case that adopted the Craig test. Um, and I just want to, I'm going to get back to this later, but Mr. Foster challenged the one-way closed-circuit television as permitted by RCW 9A44150. And in that case, four justices held the state constitutional right, um, which is meet the witness ag as against them face-to-face, -face, was not broader than the federal constitutional right. But one said, just to Alexander said that it might be, but those cases involve one-way closed circuit testimony. So um, moving back to um, Swedon, here's what they say about necessity. The letters of Maisa Haddad and the mother's physician beg the question of whether, I don't know that they used beg the question right, but let's not quibble, of whether another caregiver could have cared for the mother in the absence of Haddad for three days. We also wonder if the mother would have recovered in the near future, because as may, you probably don't remember, but I do, that she had just had surgery. So she's got a chronic condition, but she's also got um, a, a more emergent condition. Um, so she might've recovered, so we don't know. And we don't, and we don't know if she's just gonna die and then Misa Haddad can traipse all over the United States. Um, so yeah, we don't know. Um, so here's what we know doesn't satisfy prong one, necessity. Um, an out-of-state witness, 
um, a temporary disability like pregnancy, which is actually discussed in the um, Carter case, a federal case, a desire for efficiency. Um, and I, I read this today when I was reviewing Swedan. Um, what doesn't qualify is concern for um, global climate change. <laughs> I, I enjoyed that um, that her air, the airplane fuel expended would not be a good reason not to have her come. So thank you for that, Judge, Judge Fearing. And so what we're not sure about is um, whether in-person testimony poses a risk of contracting a serious illness. Is that a, is that a necessity? I don't know. And I closed, um, or I included um, Mr. Notcher from Idiocracy. And I would just like to interject that I think President Camacho would make a fine president if there are any Idiocracy fans out there. So we're not sure. We don't know um, what the effect of COVID is on Sweden because, and the holding of that case, because what if we have someone who's like immunocompromised and really cannot afford to be in the courtroom? And I would say, you know, this could be fruitful. I have, I personally have not had any cases from the um, post COVID era. I, the trials I'm working on right now are from February. So um, I guess we shall see. Um, as I mentioned, Carter talks about temporary disability and that involved a pregnancy and I, I won't read it, but they, Car the Carter court thinks that they basically could have waited this out or they could have han handled this in other ways. So I will let you all, I will not read Carter for you, but I will let you absorb it. And then I've asked the scintillating question there, is there a tension between speedy trial and confrontation? Um, probably not under the rule, which as we all know is really stingy, but um, for purposes of constitutional speedy trial, I think the um, where it starts to come into play at like nine or 11 months, as I recall, based on the more recent case law. And so once I mean, we're gonna definitely be looking at some of these um, timeframes by the time this is all over. So wait, that's maybe the problem with waiting it out. Like in Carter, we have the pregnant um, person who's like eight months pregnant. That's gonna take care of itself pretty quickly. And actually possibly Maisa Haddad's uh, mom's situation could have taken care of itself too. So that was a good case um, for the defense. Um, moving on, prong two assures the re reliability of the testimony. And this really was not a fruitful line of argument um, at oral argument or in the case, but I actually think that this could be really fruitful because things have changed since uh, December and things have changed since April. And so the court and specifically Judge Farrick, I remember him asking this, was he really poo-pooed this idea at oral argument. Um, because he was like, well, you know, this, you know, Skype is great. We all love Skype. You can see each other. It's great. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but I would say don't let this go. Um, be, and I'll get more into that. Um, you do need to make a record of the details. Um, the Bordeaux federal case gets into that. Um, and Fearing does as well in the opinion. The re there's a recent, um, maybe from June, opinion by Justice Gonzalez that was a, and I, I didn't see which attorney had um, worked on that, but it involved um, the need for in-person testimony in a termination case. And there's actually a really tremendous um, paragraph in that case that I'll be sharing in a second. And then the fact that the reliability of the testimony. So when we were talking about this in December and when this case is coming out and I'm assuming it was probably written before um, we were really in the COVID era and then edited afterwards because we all know how slow Court of Appeals editing goes sometimes those of, those of you and us who are clerks. Um, but so now we totally know how screwed up, um, and I, I was going to say um, the F word, but in case Justice Stevens was watching, she does not like cuss words, so I'm going to clean it up here. We now we know how effed up prolonged Zoom interactions are in a way that we did not at all. Um, we're all so tired of like staring at these cameras, and I just can't even, we all know how messed up this is at this point. Um, so, and that brings me to the point, um, isn't this really worse than the Craig and Foster cases where it's a closed circuit, the defense counsel 
is um, actually in the room with the witness confronting the witness. And then, so there's like a more human interaction. The only thing, the only people who are in the courtroom are the judge um, and the defendant. So actually like there's a lot of in-person stuff that's going on as contemplated by the federal statute and Craig and the state statute and Foster. And so like, I think that in a lot of ways, despite this whole idea of two way, which sounds better than one way, it's actually quite a bit worse in many ways. So that's, that's that. Um, so here's the other stuff that you need as well. If we're gonna do um, video conference testimony, I'm gonna check my time. Oh, I think we're gonna be finishing on time. So assuming the trial court allows video conference testimony, this court assesses whether other components of the confrontation clause were left intact, oath, cross-examination. Um, so just, making sure that the mechanics are good. Um, and so, but division three thinks that um, this was fine in this case, um, most likely. And the, and the other thing about her, is she's not asked to identify anyone. This is actually pretty small stuff. This is, and this is also someone who's used to sort of interacting by, um, she's a medical translator. So she's used to testifying um, or used to interacting with people um, remotely, um, which is something I, I am only recent or only now thinking about. But so the court is finding this likely adequate, um, but really there's not much of a record. Um, so if they're saying the reliability of the evidence was assured, but I say, I've said it probably a hundred times now, I don't think that this issue is dead. And I think that we all have a way better understanding now. So go forth with that in mind. Um, and I'm hoping there'll be um, some good challenges coming up. Um, next slide. Oh, yes, here's the case, the Gonzalez case that had just come out. Um, when I first gave this presentation, I'll just let this sink in. Um, this is actually perfect because it's talking about how you just can't evaluate demeanor and credibility um, remotely. And this is just such a great paragraph for challenging the reliability of Zoom testimony, in my opinion. So I'll let that absorb for a second. All right. And then next, this is in, so I in Sweden did not challenge the absence of findings. There's been some fruitful um, decisions that have been coming out where attorneys, um, appellate attorneys are challenging the lack of findings. After, I feel like after years of not really getting any purchase with this, there have been some um, decisions in the um, mental health arena, just reiterating the importance of specific findings, like the, the good old LaBelle standards. Uh, I didn't really specifically raise um, it, in this case, because it was just wholly, everything was just wholly inadequate. Like we're not even applying the right, we're not applying the right legal test. We're not even close. Um, but the court um, wanted more apparently. So they say, we're not going to decide this, but we really are going to decide this. And we're going to say um, that we do want findings and here's the, what we want the findings to be. So, um, you kind of, the court several times in Sweden and says, we're not gonna do something and then totally does it. So um, that's helpful. Um, the findings are essential. That's the last of my slides. Um, I guess my last comment um, before ending would be, um, I did not raise um, the state constitutional right. I didn't gun wallet it because I thought the federal, um, the federal um, law was actually, um, pretty much good enough in that case. And I didn't want to muddy the waters because the um, findings by the court were so obviously inadequate in this case. But I think that there might be some room here to, in the context of Skype, uh, raise gun wall challenges. Um, and that's all I'll say about that. Um, and I'll turn it over back over to Gideon, I guess. Yeah, thanks so much, Jennifer, uh, for that enlightening presentation um, with uh, ample quantities of humor, which I think we can all use right now. Um, 
<clears throat> Does anyone have any questions? You can use the raise hand feature on, um, uh, you can use the raise hand feature or uh, turn on your video and speak up. Remember to unmute yourself or you can use chat. And if nobody has any questions, then we'll move into the uh, small group session and just give a, just give a minute or so for people to formulate questions if they have them. <clears throat> 